Good morning YouTube. It is November the 17th, just after midnight, early Monday morning, uh, just after midnight local time, and this is Therefore We Speak, coming again with another video. I would like to talk about the Trinity, which is a very um, difficult doctrine to understand and to explain, and I think by nature of the question, it's beyond us as human beings to be able to fully comprehend God. How could we comprehend God? It's like trying to hold the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, in a teacup. Um, and that isn't even a suitable analogy given how amazing and how great God is. And the difference between God and man is such that we could spend all eternity seeking to understand him, knowing him, being in his presence, and never get to the bottom of who God is. It's impossible. So this is, uh, I think, too, what would make, what will make heaven so wonderful, to be dwelling forever with a great God who is beyond our comprehension and beyond our ability to fathom his love and his the depth of his power and wisdom and how unsearchable his ways are such a great god and to think that we would be able to spend um, any time with him let alone eternity it's it's um, a blessing beyond anything that we could ever deserve so thanks to god for his indescribable gift salvation and uh, imputed righteousness through the work of Jesus Christ. So I want to look into this topic of the doctrine of the Trinity somewhat. I'm not a theologian and I'm not a, an expert on these matters, just another guy who's reading the Bible and um, exposed to the same passages and, and the, the wonderful teachings about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, just as anyone else is. But I get this question sometimes when I'm talking to different people about uh, how could the doctrine of the Trinity be coherent. It might not be put that way, but that's the idea that how can Jesus be both God and the Son of God? And, you know, you'll hear sometimes, how does that make sense that uh, Jesus is God and he would pray to the Father and he's God? Is he talking to himself? That kind of thing, you hear? And just want to... Uh, read some of the uh, texts from the scriptures that touch on the topic of the Trinity and see if I can, with the help of the Lord, maybe just put my understanding forward. And this is a very difficult subject, of course. So chances are I'm going to have something funny in the way I'm looking at it that might be uh, a miss in terms of strict orthodoxy. Um, because I'm not reading off of a creedal statement. I'm just basically wanting to put forward my understanding of it. So uh, just, I think, for my own benefit in the sense that to articulate it and be able to uh, express it in a way that even though it might not be, um, again, something we can fully understand, at least in a way that's satisfactory to... Uh, what God has revealed in the scriptures, uh, what he would show us about himself. So I think it's a fair question when people of other, um, of religions, various religions, would ask about the Trinity and um, want a, an explanation of it, especially given that people come at Christianity from different backgrounds and maybe... Um, <clears throat> the one that's come at Christianity from a Jehovah's Witness background, they've been taught that the Trinity is some kind of uh, abominable heresy that is like a three-headed God or something uh, to that nature or um, sometimes you'll have people of a Islamic background that might believe based on some texts in the Quran that the Trinity is composed of the Father and the Son and the Virgin Mary. Um, so that kind of thing, there's, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings 
out there in the uh, religious systems of the world and certainly to unpack, if I can, with the Lord's grace, some of what the Bible says about the Trinity I think could be useful to those that might be seeking, genuinely seeking. And so I'm just going to pray to that end. Father in heaven, this is uh, an amazing uh, revelation of yourself that you've given in the Bible, Father, and uh, beyond our ability to comprehend, yet you are uh, your God and you are completely uh, self-consistent and and rational and the doctrine of, of who you are must be rational to help us to understand, help me to understand, help me to express some of the things that I've thought about it, Lord. If there's anything that I can bring forward with your grace, O oh Lord, to make this uh, of use and helpful to those that might hear, Lord, may it be for your glory. So just uh, direct this um, thinking and this this uh, delving into the wonderful topic, Father, of who you are, who you are, Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God. I just ask for your blessing on the words for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Okay, so I want to open up uh, just couple of passages that uh, I think are kind of interesting, that shine some light on it. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. Okay, so here is, we're introduced to the Spirit of God and God Himself. God is speaking as one, one God, and the Spirit of God is involved in moving on the face of the waters. Um, just want to drop down a little bit. Uh, let's see, there's a particular word I'm looking for, and I'm going to see it soon. Okay. Genesis 1 verse 26. This is now on the sixth day of creation. And God said, let us make man in our image. So there's a plural pronoun going on here. Uh, After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So now again a singular pronoun. So interestingly here in Genesis chapter 1, there's a a plural pronoun and there's a singular pronoun and there's reference to God speaking uh, singularly. There's also reference to the Holy Spirit of God uh, moving over the face of the deep. So there's some clues right there in the very first chapter of Genesis. One other thing I might just mention is uh, we've talked about Uh, man being created in the image of God uh, just recently in another video but just to touch on the fact that um, man we understand uh, body soul and spirit uh, from the scriptures and not being an expert on this I can't really give a um, definite definition of the difference between the soul and the spirit. Uh, clearly the body is that part of us that we can see and uh, the spirit is, uh, we know, is given by God. Um, it says in the scriptures that the spirit is given by God and returns to God. Uh, the soul, um, I don't know how to define that separate. It might have to do with the mind. Um, I, I really can't say. But anyways, we, we do know that man is body, soul, and spirit, according to the scriptures. That's my understanding. And uh, here we have God, uh, man created in the image of God. So perhaps there's some connection to the uh, design of man and the nature of God in that sense. So that was one I wanted to look at really quickly. Um, 
Okay, and there's another one we've looked at before. Uh, recently, it was was it in Genesis 18 or so? Right here, Genesis 18. Uh, this is kind of interesting, Genesis 18, 1. And the Lord, and that's all caps, Lord, in the King James. So, we understand that would be um, Jehovah or Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. So, this is the name of God. Um, the Lord appeared unto him, that's Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. Three men. So, um, going down in the text a little bit further, we see two of these men are angels. And one of them is the Lord. So, all caps, Lord in the King James. So, my understanding of that, that that would be a uh, pre... What would you say? A pre-incarnation... Um, um, is it Christophany, that kind of idea, the appearance of Christ, uh, the second person of the Trinity? Certainly it is uh, God. We know, um, you know throughout the passage that Abraham is dealing uh, with, with the Lord God Almighty in this passage. So my understanding that this passage here, Genesis 18, this would tie back to, for example, John chapter 8, um, where Jesus says, um, speaking of uh, Abraham and himself, Jesus says in John 8, 55 and following, he says, Ye have not known him, but I know him, speaking of the Father. And if I should say I know him not, I will be a liar, shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. And then Jesus says something very interesting, which might refer back to this passage of Genesis 18. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. So, this seems to me to be uh, one of the, at least one of the times when Jesus appeared to Abraham. Um, the Lord, all caps, Lord in the Old Testament in Genesis, appeared to Abraham on more than one occasion, but perhaps... This is one of the references that he would be referring to here. Uh, further on, what I guess it would be 1,800 years later, roughly, when Jesus walked the earth, God incarnate, and he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? <coughs> Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So here you have him, Jesus, that is, invoking the name of God, I am. And the Jews understand perf understood perfectly well what Jesus was saying, because it says in verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. So clearly uh, this was blasphemy to the Jews, for Jesus to say, uh, Before Abraham was I am. So that actually refers back to that word I am, or that name I am, I should say, refers back to Genesis or Exodus chapter 3. Uh, so Moses, in the account of the burning bush, in Exodus chapter 3, um, he sees this bush that's burning with fire, but the bush is not consumed. And Moses says, verse 3, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, and why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord, that's again all caps, Lord, saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. A little bit further down, uh, there's some dialogue going back and forth between Moses and God. And Moses says to God, verse 11, Who am I that I should uh, go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the token, a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, and this is all caps in the King James Bible, 
I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So this is uh, clearly the name that God was uh, revealing himself, I am, which seems to suggest self-existent, uh, simply the one that uh, exists without any dependency upon anything at all, uh, which is one way we can describe God. There's a lot of other things, of course, but um, I am that I am. So Jesus, of course, when he says in uh, John 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, and they take up stones to cast at him, clearly the Jews understood what Jesus was saying here. So this was blasphemy in their eyes, and uh, if it would have been the time for Jesus to die, I'm sure he would have died at that point, but uh, it was not the time, so he laid down his life on his own timetable. So that's uh, something that's um, interesting in terms of... Um, Jesus uh, being God and the name of God. Turning to Isaiah, I think it's 48 verse 16. Yes, here it is. So 48, 16 in Isaiah. Um, so I've heard people say sometimes that the concept of the Trinity is not in the Old Testament, but if I'm not mistaken, it is here in Isaiah 48, 16. Uh, God is speaking to the prophet. He says, Come near unto me. Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. So the speaker is God, um, the Lord, all caps Lord I believe is the speaker, uh, because if you back up a little bit in the chapter, we have... Um, Let's see, okay, he's speaking, for example, in chapter, two, in verse 2, he says, For they call themselves of the holy city, and stay themselves upon the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning. Uh, so, the Lord is speaking, all caps, Lord, God of Israel, and hearken unto me, verse 12, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. My hand also, also hath laid the foundation of the earth. And my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. All ye assemble yourselves and hear, which among them hath declared these things? The Lord, all caps again, the Lord hath loved him, and he will do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. And then he continues speaking, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this, this is the verse that I was reading earlier, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. Verse 17, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, sounds like Jesus, again this is all caps, Lord, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, and leadest, leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. So we know that God gave the commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, probably around a year and a half, or a, 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 little, <coughs> a little over a year later after the burning bush incident. So here we have, anyways, verse 16, Isaiah 48, verse 16, looks like the Trinity. You've got the Redeemer speaking, that's all caps, Lord God. Uh, he says, I was uh, in the beginning, and then he says, and the Lord God, and that's capital G-O-D, which uh, I believe might be um, something like Yahweh God in the Hebrew. I'm not sure. It might be Jehovah God. Um, and I believe this would be a reference to the Father. So Jesus is, is the one speaking. He says, there am I, and now... If that's correct, the Father and His Spirit have sent me. So, uh, to me, this looks like the Trinity. It, it seems it seems to me to be the Trinity. Okay, now going into the Psalms. Uh, and there's so much there, actually. One other thing that just occurred to me, Isaiah 48, verse 12, while I was reading this. Um, the Lord, speaking again, this is God speaking to Isaiah the prophet. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am He, I am the first. I also am the last. So my question would be, how many firsts, you're speaking about God, 
who is outside of time, he inhabits eternity, how many firsts and lasts can there be? Um, by definition, I think you can only have one. Flipping over to Revelation chapter 1 for a second, uh, we see that Jesus Christ identifies himself as in verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, or the A and to the Z of the, of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, uh, which is and which was and which is to come. So, uh, and then verse 11, uh, speaking again, uh, you know, back up to verse 10, I was in the Spirit, this is John speaking, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great trumpet, a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So there you have the first and the last. So, and he turns to look at who's speaking to him, and he sees in the midst of seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. And uh, he says, uh, where is it? Verse 17, when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Clearly, this is Jesus. So, John is seeing Jesus in a glorified state. And this is the same John that laid on his breast at the Last Supper. And uh, now, when Jesus reveals himself to him in his glory, he's flat on his face. Uh drained of all strength and he can barely even uh, look at him and the speaker identifies himself as the first and the last and clearly it's Jesus so uh, again as I was saying Isaiah 48 verse 12 hearken unto me O Jacob and Israel my called I am he I'm the first I'm also the last there can only be one first and last by definition so clearly the Lord God speaking in Isaiah is to be identified with Jesus who in verse 16 said that he was being sent by, it sounds like the Father and the Holy Spirit. So here, I'm looking for this one, Psalm 110. Um, the Lord said unto my Lord, now this is a Psalm of David. Um, so this is Jehovah, says unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Um, where is it? Uh, is that the one? I don't know if that's the one I was looking for. But uh, Jesus points out to the Jews, I think it was also in the Gospel of John, how is it if he is uh, his, his uh, descendant, it's descendant of David, how is he his Lord? So this is interesting. Jesus is the Lord and the descendant of, of uh, David. Now there's one that I was looking for um, that's referred to in... Hebrews. It doesn't really matter if I can't find it right now. I'm going to flip over to Psalm chapter 2. Uh, here we go. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So the anointed one, this is the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, and this is all caps Lord again. So, um, and speaking seemingly interchangeably this this name lord all caps lord yahweh seems to be used interchangeably for god uh, in the old testament uh, and or the i am and also refers to christ uh, yet here in this case the lord is is uh, held uh, in distinction to his anointed one which would be the christ so then, uh, dropping down to verse 7, I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And then dropping down, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, lest he be angry. So here you have one who is far more than a prophet. Uh, some religious systems would say that Jesus is uh, a prophet and a uh, albeit a, a great prophet, they'll admit that he's the Word of God. As it says, for example, in the Quran, it says that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Just read that today in the Quran. Uh, also, uh, we understand from the Quran, uh, uh, I think it's Surah 1919, that Jesus Christ is pure, so without sin. And uh, we understand from even the Quran testifies that he's coming again. So. Uh, there's many interesting things. Also, the Quran says that Jesus was um, 
simply uh, created by fiat by God as opposed to uh, the natural process. Um, now, of course, we understand that Jesus himself, uh, the Son of God, is not a created being, but just to point out that even the Quran, which would say that Jesus is less than the Son of God and God in the flesh, has to admit that there are many um, attributes and characteristics of Christ Jesus which far ex exceed any other prophet, including uh, their last prophet, as they would call Muhammad. So, uh, let's see, where else am I going to look for a moment? Of course, we have Colossians. Um, that says in verse chapter 2 and verse uh, 10, speaking of Christ Jesus, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So here you see in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. I'm going to flip over to John, um, speaking of Jesus being equal with God and incarnate, uh, that is in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Dropping down to verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So we have the Son, the Word, the Logos, who is <coughs> equivalent with God, uh, called God and made flesh, the Incarnation. We have Jesus in John chapter 14 speaking of giving a comforter, which contrary to some misinterpretations does not refer to another prophet, but refers to the Holy Spirit. Um, and this is very clear from the passage. If we look in John chapter 14, uh, some more information about uh, the Trinity. Uh, Jesus says, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So clearly, Jesus speaking of the Spirit of truth, this is not a prophet to come, as some uh, religions, for example, Islam has said, well, this comforter is a reference to the coming uh, last prophet, in their view. Well, clearly, Jesus says, this comforter is with you and shall be in you. So this does not apply to any man. This is the Holy Spirit of God. Dropping down further to verse 26 of John 14, And the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit of God, who will come after he has ascended to the Father. In fact, the Lord even says, uh, it's necessary for me to go. Uh, verse six, Chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So this is a very interesting uh, passage where Christ Jesus speaks of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and uh, of sin, because they believe not on me. Well, to be set free from sin, one must believe on Jesus. Um, you have to come to know Jesus to be set from, free from sin. To the Jews that believed on him, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Speaking of being free from sin. So, uh, here we see that the Holy Spirit uh, is going to convict the world of sin, because they have chosen not to believe on Jesus, because they would prefer to stay in the darkness and love their sin. Of righteousness, because Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the law, he died, rose again, is ascended to the Father. And of judgment, because uh, the prince of this world is judged. So, um, the uh, coming judgment um, is a uh, divine truth that God is convicting the world of. So, anyways, just some uh, points about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father uh, being all God. Philippians chapter 2 is another interesting passage. I'll just flip there for a second. 
uh, talks about the person of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Uh, reading from the King James again, the authorized version, Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in, 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and become, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So here's the work of Jesus Christ and the person. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, this is actually a quote, I believe, from Isaiah, what is it, 30-something, I think it was. A brother was mentioning this the other day. Uh, <clears throat> The Lord says, uh, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee will bow. Um, where is that one? Let's see if I can find it quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking for it. That was one I didn't know the reference to. I think it's in Isaiah 30-something, um, where God says, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Um, anyways, that, that reference from Philippians chapter 2 is um, applied to Jesus Christ. So we know Jesus is God in the flesh. Um, no human, merely human sacrifice could pay for the sins of the world. The offended party is God. When we sin, every sin is against God. As David said, against you and you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. Therefore you are justified when you judge. So we know that God is the offended party, and God must pardon. Um, at the same time, man is the guilty party, and man must pay the debt. So this is the wonderful uh, relevance, I'll say, of Jesus Christ, the God-man. As the scripture says, there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, I just want to get into some of the doctrinal issues um, around the Trinity for just a few minutes. Oh, I'm over half an hour already, so I'll try to make this quick, but I think this is important as well, because one thing I find that is that the uh, person and the work of Christ Jesus are very often attacked, almost without fail, one or the other, or both, is attacked uh, by false religious systems. So, and it's, there's no wonder, because if Jesus is not God in the flesh, then he can't atone for our sins. Um, and uh, the work is often attacked. Uh, for example, the Islamic religion would say that Jesus uh, did not die on the cross, but the Christians were and the Jews perhaps were deceived into thinking he did. So, um, whereas Jesus, of course, he says, I was dead and I am alive. He said, just like the prophet Jonas, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, in the belly of a whale, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So, we know that Jesus Christ died and he descended and set uh at liberty, the captives, those that were his, that were captive um, in Sheol, the Old Testament uh, abode of the righteous dead, and they were liberated by Christ Jesus. So uh, he had to die, and he had to be God, and he also had to be man. So 
here's the heart of Christianity, that person and the identity of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes all the difference. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, uh, when you look at different religious systems briefly, we look at, for example, the Jehovah's Witness religion, they will say that Jesus Christ is not God. Um, so, their Jesus cannot save. He is not divine. He cannot bear the sins of the world. He cannot be a sin bearer. Hence, as a Jehovah's Witness, you must try to work your way to heaven. And, of course, that is doomed to failure. And unless they repent of their self-righteous um, works that are filthy rags in the sight of a holy God, they will be damned to a hell they don't believe in. Um, so, and, and that's an attack also on the doctrine of Christ Jesus, who spoke of hell, the place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Uh, you have the Mormon religion, which would uh, blasphemously um, call Jesus Christ the brother of Lucifer, of Satan, as if, uh, what, what blasphemy? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to call him the brother of a fallen angel, such wickedness, such blasphemy, and to think that they would, uh, the 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 uh, Mormon would religion would uh, try to pass itself off as Orthodox Christianity, and more so in recent years. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from Hebrews chapter one here. I know this video is long, but this is worthwhile. I think to look at. Um, God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. There we have the Logos, the divine expression, Jesus Christ, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Praise God. Purged our sins. They're done with forever. It is finished, he said, from the cross. Paid in full. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Uh, who would get an inheritance? Who but the firstborn son, the only begotten son? Um, for unto which of the angels... Now this is contrasting Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, with an angel. For unto which of the angels... Said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. Hmm. It says in, uh, what is it, Exodus 20, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Here we have the scriptures, God himself, saying, Angels, worship Jesus. God, who will not share his glory with another, says to the angels, worship the Son. This reminds me of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, I think it is. We need to look at that briefly as well. Um, so, he says, let all the angels of God worship the Son, Jesus. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But, Contrasting now, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is the psalm quotation I was looking for that I couldn't find, but it's in Hebrews here as well. The, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Uh, so... This is this is amazing. Uh, he also says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. What do we read in Genesis chapter 1? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So Jesus, uh, the, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, laying the foundation of the earth here, as we see in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. Um, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou shalt not fail. Um, but thou art the same, thy years shall not fail. And to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So here we have um, a description of the sun versus angels, which should forever put to rest any of the false doctrine from the pit of hell. Uh, and I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say that, 
that has ensnared so many uh, untold thousands of Muslims, people that are of this uh, false religion, the so-called Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. Their Jesus is not the Jesus of this book. The Jesus of this book is God in the flesh. He's no angel, certainly no brother of Lucifer. Okay, uh, or Michael the Archangel, they might say various things like that. Uh, just while I'm on the topic, I know this video is running long, but this is important, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, Exodus chapter 20, just going to flip over here. <coughs> okay, um, speaking of of uh, worshipping God. I am the Lord thy God. I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water and the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. No image. Why not? Well, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Uh, God has made an image. He hasn't made an image. He has an image. And that is the Son incarnate. And He is worshipped in heaven. Uh, here we go over to Revelation chapter 5. And uh, again we have the Trinity. Uh, we have the and I don't understand this, we have the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Maybe this is connected to the seven gifts of the spirit, if there's seven, but uh, at any rate, we've got seven spirits of God referenced. He came, who is he? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Verse 7, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. That would be the father. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, or living creatures, and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. That's Jesus. So they're falling down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials, full of incense or odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's like a hundred million, I believe, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive. Here we have worship, pure, unmixed worship of the lamb in the presence of the father, the one, the God who said, I will not share my glory with any other. And the Lord Jesus is receiving this amazing worship. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as were in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lives forever and ever. So there's no mistaking that Jesus Christ is divine. So this should put to, to rest any notions of Christ being, as the JW religion would say, a creature, as the Mormon religion would say, a brother of Satan, as the Islamic religion would say, a mere prophet. We're talking about God wrapped up in human flesh. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this is a very important doctrine. And to lose sight of who Christ Jesus is, is to lose the heart of the gospel. It's to lose the power of the atonement. If you're worshipping a false Jesus, if your Jesus is not the Jesus of this book, then you don't have a Jesus who can save. He himself said that many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and deceive many. It's prophesied. These false religious systems are prophesied. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24 and elsewhere, the Lord talks about um, verse 24, 24, and there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and we know even great signs and wonders shall be done uh, by the Antichrist. And that spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well. It was alive and well, I shouldn't say well, but certainly is alive and functioning in the earth today as it was even in the first century when John said that that spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. 
So, speaking about, clearly the Bible um, indicates that God is one God. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt uh, worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. I don't know where that is. I think it's in Deuteronomy somewhere, but certainly God is one. So, to imagine that the Christian conception of God as being three gods, this is completely false. Um, this is a misrepresent misrepresentation of the doctrine of God, uh, the Christian doctrine of God, as we understand from the Holy Bible, from his own revelation. It's a, it's a total misrepresentation and misunderstanding. It's a straw man. Um, so the things that these various religious systems are attacking, um, they're not even, this is not even the doctrine of God, of the scriptures. Uh, what they attack, uh, these false religious systems, um, would be attacking are not is not the doctrine of uh, the Lord God of the Bible. Okay, um, let's see. Here we go. Deuteronomy six verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Wonderful. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. So, the Lord our God is one Lord. So, the Trinity. How would I try to explain it? I'm just, again, a mere man. Obviously, I um, to comprehend the nature of God is like trying to, as I said, scoop out the Pacific Ocean in a teacup. It's not going to happen. But... We can draw some analogies. Different analogies have been drawn, like the three states of water, for example. Water can be uh, ice, it can be solid, it can be uh, gas, it can be a liquid. Um, yet they're all water in one form or another. That's not a really good analogy because typically water is going to be in one state or another. As far as I know, I'm not a chemist, but uh, depending on the temperature and pressure. So... Um, this is the way I like to think about it. And here is where, if I'm going off base or down some bunny trail that's not biblical, feel free to comment and uh, set me straight on this. But here's here's the way I've been thinking about it. If you look at the... Uh, I'm going to start by saying uh, something I said to a Jehovah's Witness who came to my door years ago um, to try to explain uh, succinctly what... Uh, the relationship of the father and the son would be. Uh, there happened to be a father and son Jehovah's Witness standing at my door that day. And um, I said to the uh, the elder, the older one of the, of the pair, I said, are you a man? And he's, yes, I'm a man. I said to the son, who was uh, probably uh, late teens, early 20s, are you a man? Yes, I'm a man. And I said, you're a man and you're a man. You're the father and you're the son. How can that be? How can you both be men if you're the father and you're the son? Just trying to illustrate the um, um, error of saying the same thing about God. How could you say about God um, to Jesus, you're the son and to the father, you're the father. How can you both be God? I mean, we just have to understand, I think, in a greater way what God is. Um, is in terms of the definition of God. And by that I mean, I don't think God is a person. I think God is a being, um, an entity, a single, singular entity that is one in purpose, one in motive, one in uh, desire, one in uh, in power and in, and, in, in, uh, um, in goodness. His, his attributes uh, are singular and equally shared uh, among the persons of the Trinity. So there's one God and three persons, one being, three persons. And each of those persons of the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are all equally God. Just like uh, a grandfather, and or not just like, but analogous to a grandfather and a, and a, and a father and a son um, being uh, all humans, and yet three distinct persons. So now, if we think about the nature of God, how he has all power, uh, he's omnipresent, uh, he knows all things, um, 
is singular in his desires, his motives, his pure, he's holy. Probably I think this is like the primary attribute of God, his holiness. Uh, altogether separate from sin. And altogether separate from his creation. <coughs> think about that. Um, how is it possible that the three persons of the Godhead as revealed in the Holy Bible could be anything but each fully God? Um, if they are a part of God, they are fully God. There's no other way. Uh, you couldn't have a part of infinity. Um, either you have it, the, the infinite is either uh, possessed by each one, or, or they're finite. Uh, neither the, the, none of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are finite beings. They're infinite beings. They're eternal. They uh, have all power, all wisdom. Um, so there's no way that a person could possess that, a person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, could possess the being of God in some finite way. It's, it's, infinity doesn't work that way as far as I can understand. So maybe to explain it a little bit better, if uh, we think about, um, say, uh, if all of the people on earth, humanity, were a single, uh, essentially a single organism, because we all could communicate, say, just for instance, t uh, telepathically, we could all be connected in spirit, spiritually connected. Um, if we all had the exact same desires and motivations, if we all knew what each other was always thinking, and if the thing that uh, one member of the human race wanted was identical to what all the other ones wanted and that action that that one would take would be the same action that the others would take in the same circumstances if they were in those same circumstances. So if you had all of humanity interconnected in some kind of uh, like a, I don't know, I don't want to get into science fiction but like the Borg, all plugged in together, all one uh, essential being, um, they would all represent, each one would singularly as individual persons represent the whole. Um, so I guess when you're talking about God being infinite uh, in his being, if he's fully expressed in three persons, um, then they couldn't be anything but God, each one. So I don't know if I've mangled this. I'm trying to, I think I explained it a little bit uh, more concisely earlier today when I was talking with a family member about this but at any rate um, I just see that uh, the nature of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit um, by definition um, partaking in the Godhead they are all divine it's inescapable one being again three persons uh, so uh, singular in um, their desires, their uh, eternality, if that's a word, their uh, power, uh, their knowledge, um, their, their will, uh, all so singular, uh, these three persons, as they are members of the Godhead, that they are, uh, in a sense, indivisible um, in terms of their being, but in their persons, they are divided, having... Uh, the different roles. So, uh, Jesus being the divine expression, so um, he is the, uh, how does it say, the um, expressed uh, radiance of his glory, I believe is the way the New Testament puts it in one place. So, Jesus Christ being that that part of God that is, in a sense, extended out. And, and if you can say part of God, you probably can't even say that. Um, and be orthodox. So anyways, I better stop before I uh, go down a bunny trail. But point being that the scriptures clearly show the attributes of God are uh, held by the Holy Spirit, held by the Son, uh, held by the Father, and um, yet they're three distinct persons. So I guess in a nutshell, I would say, I'd close, let me tie this off by saying, if we could fully describe God, he wouldn't be God, and we wouldn't be men. Um, so, by definition, 
we shouldn't expect to be able to tie it into a neat little package and lay it on the table and and comprehend it that if we could do that he wouldn't be God so I would say uh, the wisest thing to do is to tremble at God's word so if he's revealed himself in this way as he has in the Holy Bible and we trust in God to both uh, deliver and to preserve his word because of that um, we would be wise to take him at his word uh, once we start throwing things out that are unpalatable uh, to the fallen nature or incomprehensible to the mortal mind then we have created a God in our own image an inferior God who cannot save so I would just challenge anyone who's perhaps Lord willing made it this far 55 minutes um, just challenge anyone who's made it this far if you would come to God then come to the God of this book the Holy Bible come to the God of this book he is uh, Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit he's mighty to save uh, all those who come to him and as Jesus said, he that does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. He that has the Son has the Father also. So, um, praise God. He is good. He has given his Spirit to us mere mortals. Who are we? Jars of clay, mere creatures, to partake of this gift of the Spirit of God. So may we really understand that and reverence uh, God and... Uh, um, be, be motivated to walk in holiness and to please Him, to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh and be led by the Holy Spirit of God. As it says in Romans chapter 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So I'll leave it at that tonight. It's almost an hour. Um, I don't expect many people are going to make it this far, but that, uh, that uh, is just a consequence of talking too long, I guess. So uh, I'm going to say good night. It is uh, probably pushing one or so in the morning on November the 17th. And therefore we speak over and out. Until next time, God bless you.